Okay. Welcome back to the Speaking and Communicating Podcast. I am your host, Robert Tandlela. If you are looking to improve your communication skills, both professionally and personally, this is the podcast you should be tuning into. Communication and soft skills are crucial for your career growth and leadership development. By the end of this episode, please log on to Apple and Spotify, leave us a rating and a review, and what you'd like for us to discuss on this podcast that will be beneficial to you. Now let's get communicating with my guest today, Juan Alvarado Jr., who is a keynote speaker and a leadership coach. He is here to talk to us about, wait for it, the seven deadly sins of leadership, how to be a courageous leader, and many more other valuable insights. And before I go any further, please help me welcome him to the show. Hi, Juan. Hi, thank you so much for having me. I, it's a pleasure. Thank you for being here. Welcome. Please tell us a little bit about yourself before we get to the meaty part. Yeah, uh, so I grew up in Southern California and uh, right after high school, I joined the military. And so that's where a lot of the, my leadership skills come from. So 10 years in the, in the uh, United States Army was deployed in Operation Iraqi Freedom and became a police officer. So my leadership uh, changed a little bit, but added to that. And then I left to become a director of programs where uh, I oversaw over 200 staff. And then I had to personally mentor 30 to 35 uh, managers where I failed many times and where I grew many times. And that um, was huge for my for my growth. And I can get more into that uh, later. But uh, I left that because I wanted to do more. And I felt like I was handcuffed a little bit uh, with the organization that I was with, cause I wanted to do more. I felt like we, if we didn't make a change that we were going to get kind of get left behind. And so I started to make these changes on my own and, uh, doing stuff online and other people were having me speak. And when I started to help them grow, I realized I can be a vessel for other people outside of the nonprofit that I was working for. And so I decided to leave that organization so that I could help more people than just the, you know, altogether 235 people that I was helping. I was like, I can, I can have a bigger impact uh, on the world and the world can have a bigger impact on me if I was to leave this uh, place. And so I did. And so that's where we are today. Mm. Here's the interesting part about the military. And this is purely based from what we see on TV and the movies. When we talk about leadership nowadays and how it's more people focused and you should have empathy and listen to your team, it seems like the opposite of that. <laughs> uh, we, we joke around, there's a saying in the, in I think all the branches of the military, hurry up and wait, right? They want you to hurry, 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 get things done, get things done, get things done. And then you wait around and they're like, well, we're not ready yet. <laughs> and so <laughs> a, lot, a lot of waiting, a lot of hurrying up, a lot of do, uh, do it, but in the military, um, compared to the workplace, even though there's, there's some similarities, there is a hierarchy, right? You have ranks, right? You have, you know, a, a, a private, private first class, a specialist, a sergeant, a staff sergeant, a sergeant first class, sergeant major. You have all these different, and then you have different officers. By the emblem, right? By the symbol, you know who you need to respect and where you have authority. Um, you know, I see somebody that's lower ranking than me. I know that I have the authority in the workplace. You can pass somebody in a high rise building and not know who they are. And, you know, that's where the empathy part comes in. Maybe more questions come in because you don't know, you might not know who that is, but in the military, you know who it is automatically. Do I stand and salute you? You know, do I stand at attention? Do I shut up and listen or do I give direction? And so it's a little bit of the opposite. I think it's the opposite because outsiders don't fully under, understand. Um, but I think in the military, you have to, um, again, shut up and listen because people have, have maybe more experience than you. They know what's going on because uh, a lot of it is a need to know basis, right? So a little right. bit different than the, than the workplace. And, and that is why one of the reasons why some people, not all people, but some people that come out of the military have a really either tough time getting into work 
because their mind, the way they think is different. The ones that do succeed understand I need to make a change or they, or they understand their position on the totem pole where they are. I'm just going to shut my mouth, listen and do work, which is why you have organizations here in the United States, like a um, Home Depot or Lowe's that is high demand physical wise that hire uh, military veterans because they know, Hey, you're my boss. You tell me what to do. I'm just going to work. And just going to do it. Yeah. Right. Mm. Because like I said, yeah, it, it looks like the opposite. And then it becomes interesting when we meet someone like you who says, Hey, of all the things I could have chosen when I left the military, I want to be a leadership coach. Yeah. Mm. I think a lot of it had to do with being under, um, leaders that don't fully understand leader leadership and this will be kind of like the first nugget that i give you i feel that uh leader some leaders especially in the military and in the workplace for that matter lead off of their authority when true leadership leads off of their influence um mm, authority yeah so leaders uh, some leaders lead with their authority when better leadership will lead with their influence. And so I lead you because you see me doing something, you understand my heart, you understand my passion, you understand um, that I want best for the organization, I want the best for you, then I want the best for me like me in, you know, in that order. So I'm, I put myself last, where people who use their authority, use their title to make their decisions and not their personality or their character to make to make those decisions. And so I tell people, if you want to use your authority, use it for decision making, right? We need to make a vote. Do we do this event or do we add this to our policies and procedures? It's a tie score, right? On voting. Hey, yeah. as the boss, I'm going to use my authority and I'm going to vote this way or that way. That's what you use your authority for. But if I'm trying to lead people, I shouldn't use my authority. Authority is never, has never made people jump out of their seat and say, Oh, I want to follow him or her because they're really mean and they use their power and aggression to get things done. It's, I would it's hope a, not. <laughs> yeah. Right. Nobody jumps at, at, at that. But when you mm -hmm. see like, dang, this guy has hired 10 people and those 10 people have gone on to bigger and better things. I want to follow that guy. Um, or, or that woman, that woman that she'll sit down and listen to you. And, you know, there's another saying that says, um, you know, you should go somewhere where, where you are appreciated and not tolerated. Like I want to yes. go somewhere where somebody appreciates me. And so I think that was one of the bigger things that I found that if you want to level up in leadership, you need to work on your influence and not necessarily your authority. Influence and not the authority. And then the authority part as well. If you flip that it, when it comes to the military, for instance, there is a part where it's necessary, like you said, but then that's why they find it challenging to then adapt to the corporate environment because it, it has that, let's get everyone involved in the decision-making, et cetera. So what would you say are the seven deadly sins of leadership? Yeah, um, those are to me constantly changing or, or should I say changing depending on who I, who I speak to. What I like to do when I go into organizations is I like to talk to the leadership and then I talk to the staff because uh, when I do that, I find that leadership thinks one thing and the organization or the, the staff think co something completely different. And so there's miscommunication. I went into one organization where they said, oh, we just did a survey and they, you know, we had really good communication and uh, they, we got scored really well. But then when you talk to them, they're like, no. I'm afraid that if I say anything negative on these surveys, there's going to be repercussions. And My so, job. Yes. Who yeah. to lose their job over being honest? <laughs> so, <laughs> so there's miscommunication. So when I gave them my survey, they felt better to talk about a, you know, uh, to an outsider than it was to their own, to their own people. So when I go into organizations, usually three or four of those deadly sins are, um, are true every across the board. Some of them I switch out because it's like, why are you, why are you doing this? Right. So one of them, one of them that comes on and off of that list, uh, because some organizations are different is, um, that we feel that yearly evaluations are enough, right? When do you do evaluations once a year? And what that happens, it, what happens is those yearly evaluations usually happen at the end of the year. 
Well, then what happens is it says pretty much in a nutshell, this is what you do really well. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Keep on doing this, this, and this. You've met these numbers. You've met the, this, uh, these standards, but this is where you can improve. Well, why would you tell that to somebody at the end? Why would you, t why would you wait 11 months, 12 months to tell somebody this is what you need to change? And so one, the, one of those deadly sins are thinking that a yearly evaluation is enough when in schools for our kids, they do progress report, mm -hmm. report card, progress report, report card. There's a report about your progress, which is why when new there's new hires, there are, you know, 30, 60, 90 day evaluations. And then they say, okay, you're good enough. You get the job. If not, you didn't meet it. We're going to let you go because it's not a good fit. So you do a really good job at that. But then after you don't do it until a year later and a year after that. And there's some people that even their management doesn't get any evaluations. So there's other organizations that do it really, really well, which is why that comes off and on the list, depending on, on who it is. So definitely do my research first before I teach this, this one, but mm -hmm. that's one. Uh, another one is the statement of this is how we've always done it. Oh, um, a lot of people, a lot of organizations don't understand why they do it. I find this a lot in, budget departments in HR departments where people will ask, well, why do we do that? Well, that's just the way it is. And then you look at the policies and procedures and you're like, that's not even a rule. That's not even a policy. <laughs> why are we, why are we doing this? And you find you out know that. What's funny is that I usually hear that when we talk about, I'm South African, I'm from the Zulu culture. Mm. There's things in my culture that I absolutely love majority of them, but there are things where I'm like, who started this and why? It doesn't make sense. Of, oh no, this is how we've always done it in ancient Zulu culture. I mean, maybe that could work in my culture because it's an individual thing, but in the workplace where there's so many people affected, how do they get stuck in that mentality of this is how we've always done it? Yeah, I think it goes back to that to the authority piece. I am in HR or I'm the director, I'm in charge. Maybe I don't want to deal with it right now. Maybe I have a chip on my shoulder and there's somebody that uh, maybe I don't get along with. I don't like, they were snotty with me. So I'm going to be snotty right back and no, you can't do that. And so then somebody says that and well, how come they got to do it? And they, and, and I can't, well, it's a policy and, and they're just talking through their, you know, through their back end, and they're trying to prove a point to be that power trip. And then all of a sudden it becomes policy or procedure. And so, somebody needs to ask the question and actually answer the question. Why do we continuously do this? Like why, why there's always, I've learned my CEO taught me this. Um, and it was very humbling. Your ideas are not always the best ideas, mm. which is perfectly fine. The, I got a mentor that said every idea is a good idea until we find the best one. And then that's yeah. a continuous process. There might be a better one than the better one. So now there's a better, a, a best one, a better one, right? And so uh, you have to be you have to be open to that. But there's a lot of systems that people have, and people ask, "There's got to be a better way." And when they ask, "Well, this is how we've always done it." Well, why? Nobody can answer. There's a story that I heard, and you know, it's don't know if it's true. It's kind of just like a fable, but that there's a little girl who asks her mom, "Can you teach me how to make?" uh this uh uh dinner this this um like meatloaf right and it's meat right. in a in a pan and so they go and they they start to make it and so the mom goes and she puts it in in the the container and it comes out of the oven she takes it out and then she cuts it she cuts both ends uh off of it like the butt ends the front end and the back end and then she puts it on a serving platter and they pour the dressing stuff over it the the sauce stuff on it and the little girl asks mom why did you cut those ends off and she goes, that's what you're supposed to do. And so the daughter asks, well, why did you, but why? And she goes, that's how my mom taught me. And so she goes, go ask grandma. So she goes to ask grandma and she goes, grandma, why do we cut, why did, why do we cut the ends off? My mom keeps on cutting these ends off. Why, why do we do that? What, what happens with those ends? And she goes, sweetie, I cut the ends off because the serving platter that I had was too small. 
so that's the whole reason why they she made it in this thing and when she put it in the serving tray the serving tray was smaller than the thing so she had to cut it so okay. it wouldn't yeah. fall off the ends of it that's the only reason why i cut the ends off and so for generations they were cutting the front it and the back ends off on without anyone questioning right back to the culture thing as well right yeah. and it, and here's here's the key it took a little in this story it took a little girl and the thing that i love about children and learning about children is they're always curious and here's another mm -hmm. deadly sin is you need to be curious like a child and if you're not curious like a child you will always end up doing the same things over and over again if you look at a kid they're always curious they're always asking questions why 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 and what happens is the parent the authority figure says because i said so because i am your mother i am your father you do what i say and then that carries over into, into the, workplace. the workplace yeah which then think about it let's look at the other side of this from a leader's point of view if something seems to have worked all these years is it a i'm afraid to take the risk and try something new thing just in case it backfires because we could lose mm. money we could things might turn upside down yeah would everything is risky everything reason? is risky say it again Sorry, would that be the reason sometimes they are reluctant to make a change, even if something it, is not necessarily it, working? It, it could be, it could be, but everything's risky, right? Going going on a walk is risky. You can go walk around the block and you can get hit by a car. You can, somebody can mug you. It's risky, mm. but there's also a risk in not doing it. What if you were to be able to walk around the street, around the block every single day for your health and you don't do it and you end up having a heart attack because your heart is weak? So it's risky to do it. And it's also risky not to do it, but you'll never know unless you do it. What I think it's Jim Rohn that says what's easy to do is also easy not to do. So sometimes you have leadership that don't want to do something new or try something new because we don't have the time. I think a lot of it has to do with risk, but I don't have the time. I don't have the energy. I don't want to do that. But if somebody's asking me, why do we do this? I might just say, hey, find out. You find out. You. It's kind of like with issues and problems, right? I don't want to hear a problem and an issue in the workplace if you're uh, when you bring it to my attention, if you're not bringing two or three solutions or something that you've tried for the last 30 or 60, 90 days, and then it hasn't worked. Come with solutions to the problem, but don't don't come to, to the party with just a problem. Come with solutions. Right. Mm. And so um, in this case, if someone is to ask why, I'm going to say, OK, come back in two or three weeks. You let me know why and how and some different ways to do this. And the reason why I do that is two, uh, I am, I might not have the time. So I'm giving it to somebody who's passionate about it, who has the question. If somebody's curious and has a question, then they're going to have the heart and the, and the desire to do the work. But if it's not important to the leader, then they're going to give some half answer or, or whatever it is. And so that other person is going to do it wholeheartedly. One, two, now I've delegated something and true delegation is is to empower somebody right and so one of the things that i've learned pretty recently in in leadership is delegation doesn't always mean to empower but to mm. empower somebody always means to delegate and what i mean by that is i can give you a job and say here do this paperwork right just do this paperwork i just i i don't have time to do it just do it but if you come and continuously ask me questions, is it okay to do this with this piece of paper? Can I not approve this one? If you keep on asking me for answers, then you don't, you have not been empowered. You are doing it the way I would have, I would have done it. Right. It's almost kind of like just a, following instructions, no critical right. thinking, no right. putting my idea into anything. Yeah. But if I, but if I ask you, how would you do it? Why would you do it this way? OK, so then go ahead and I've actually powered you or given you the empower to do that. Then that's true. That's true delegation. I'm I'm empowering them to do something with their own thought process, with their own authority. Um, I, I kind of give the example of if I uh, hired you to decorate my home, if you keep on asking me what kind of colors I want and does do you want this couch or this couch? I decorated it, not you. So I delegated something to you. I didn't empower you. But if I empowered you to do something, then, I, then I've also delegated something. And now you have free reign to do it however you want with no permission, with no, without anything. And what does that do in the long run? That builds trust. Because if you do a good job, then I'm going to say, okay, now I have something else for you to do. 
And so that's one of the other deadly sins is, is having as a leader, you have your hand into everything. You don't think you're micromanaging, but you kind of are. It's a different form of micromanaging because no one can yeah. do anything without your permission. So a lack of empowerment equals a lack of trust and you don't trust your staff. And so that's a deadly sin because then staff aren't going to want to work for you if they don't feel that you trust them. Just on that point, let's talk about what's been happening on the in the last three years with the pandemic, because before your boss could just check, you know, come to your cubicle and say, hey, let me see one. How have you done here or something like that? Now you had remote work micromanaging which a lot of leaders were accused of because they also wanted to see are they still working am i paying them but they're sleeping <laughs> at home or whatever it is <laughs> when it comes to that delegation and empowerment point you've raised what would you say especially with the clients you've worked with what were some of the challenges that they faced and what did they do about it um i think that the bigger problem during the pandemic was the lack of of um, true communication, right? So like you you said, you had uh, leadership saying, is the work getting done? Are you even getting stuff done? Uh, what have you gotten done? Let me look at numbers because they had never done done this type of work before, right? No one had done remote type working besides organizations who always had remote work, right? There's a lot of customer right. service places that have always done remote work. Um, and what it, what it revealed was how insecure leadership was. I think a lot of people don't fully understand. Uh, one of the things I write, I have people do in, in my leadership classes is write down all the issues and problems that you have. And so a lot of them, most of them, 99% of them are my staff do this, my staff do that, my staff don't understand this, my staff don't understand that. And what we find is, is that everything is everybody else's fault. And none of the things that they list are my fault or my issues or my my problems and so leadership is is or the way your team plays is a reflection of of the management or the leadership right mm. uh, i think gallup has a poll that says 51 percent of people who le leave the workforce leave due to the manager so yes. the manager has we a used lot to think it's to do the that. money it's not the money it's not number one reason at least right yeah. what i've what i found with that is it's value some people will connect uh money to value which is true but a lot of it is do you value me as a person do you value me as as somebody who has a family do you value my education and so just to that point uh a little off subject but i'll, I'll stick with it is you know do you do you value your worker do you value the recognition which is what i was going to get to with the pandemic part but um a lot of organizations are paying for child care do you do you care for me that not enough where you're offering child care there's some organizations that that built a daycare they hired a, a manager for the daycare and they hired three or four people to switch, you know, um, um, hours of work so that employees can go back to work. Um, mm. Some people are paying people to go to the gym because people got, you know, lazy and got uh, gained weight and their health went and their health declined because gyms were closed. And now they're paying for people to go work out. So you value my health. And so everything I see when it comes to that is do you value money do they get paid what they're supposed to get paid do you value their family time their time out of work their time with their kids can they just say hey i have a i have a family emergency go ahead and go it's okay we'll we'll cover your stuff let me know if everything's okay and then the follow-up right so it's it's the value do you value holistically the person um but going back to the the issue during the during the pandemic i think a piece that was huge was the recognition piece and gallup uh finds that uh recognition needs to be done every seven days now that's hard for people that have a lot of uh, of employees like you can't go to 300 400 employees every seven days because it's just too much but that's just where the number switches right do i have really good engagement from my staff i when i say that they do a good job and i rec recognize them it's still up higher than you know day one two three four five six but it's the it's the around the seventh day is where it's the highest peak. And so you can still go eight, nine, 10, maybe 12 days. It's still higher than nothing, higher mm -hmm. than 30 days, but seven is where it's the peak. So I think we lost the recognition piece because people and leaders were so involved in, are you getting the work done? Can I really trust this person? And again, what it revealed was 
when I talked about writing the things down that you have an issue with, yeah, you turn those things around. Are my staff really working? Mm, you need to work on your trust. Um, do uh, they don't feel valued? Do I communicate with my staff? Do I value my staff? Um, and so any issues and problems, I always tell leaders the biggest pill to swallow is where did I go wrong? What am I not doing enough of? And that's hard as a leader to recognize how do I take responsibility for 100% of that 1%? So if I think you're wrong 99% and I'm only wrong 1%, I still have to own 100% of that 1%. I have to own all of it. And so when people say, uh, well, this staff is disrespectful. Well, if they're disrespectful, that's saying that they don't respect you. So then what do I need to do? Where did I go wrong that makes my staff feel that it's okay to disrespect me? Do I not respect myself? Do I not respect them? Is the word out there that I don't respect people? So how it reveals, it uncovers what I'm not doing, right? It's like a sunburn. You go outside, you get sunburned. You, you, you start to realize I can't be out for an hour without sunblock or I can't go do this without doing something. So it, it exposes where you lack. And so sometimes it's good to write those issues out. And then how do you turn those on yourself to say, Ooh, where do I lack? How do I fix this? Mm. Because that's the thing. The team is a reflection of the leader. So if they at first before, you know, they do all the training with you, if they at first think the staff, the team is the problem, how receptive are they to say, hey, wait a minute, maybe let's switch the mirror and make it look back at you? Yeah, so I, I hang my hat on the compliment that people give me when they say, um, when we ask them about like how the training went, they say Juan was the most real, the most authentic, and the most relatable trainer that we've had. Because I'm not going to sugarcoat things. I'm not going to make say like, hey, well, we don't do that, you know, kind of like with parenting. Hey, you know, Johnny, we don't do that. I tell my boys, come here. What went wrong? What happened? Whose fault was that? Why do you think it's this person's fault? What can you take? What can you take responsibility for? And I'm just upfront with people. We talk about, you know, courageous conversations. Um, and for those leaders, I try to ask them questions that they can relate to. Do you feel like how energized are you throughout the day? Uh, how stressed are you? Um, what, what do you feel causes your stress at home or at this? And I make them realize, well, maybe I'm not energized throughout my day because I'm eating, a whole, I'm not eating well, right? Do you have breakfast? No, I just walk out and I grab, you know, a banana and my coffee. So you don't, you don't have anything nutritious and then you're just putting caffeine in you. So you have this high out uh, of with caffeine and then you have this low. So you're not energized because you're not putting like wh whose fault is that oh it's my fault right it's not that my spouse didn't make me breakfast or people say i don't have time okay well if you write out that sentence i don't have time then who's whose fault is that oh it's whose time management or lack thereof is that well and here's the thing i i challenge people on that statement of time management because you can't manage time like right now if you needed an extra hour could you stop the clock no no so you can't manage time you can manage yourself though. Huh. And so it's not time management, it's self-management. And, and this is a big issue that people say, I don't have enough time. They're blaming it on the time, on the time where true leadership takes ownership, right? Ownership of, the, of the, their issues and problems, right? And again, when you can take, I tell my boys, I have three boys, uh, 11, 14, and 15. I tell them, you will become a better man and a better leader and this goes, I would tell this if I had daughters, I just I don't have any daughters. Uh, yeah, you would become yeah. a better woman mm. if you can own up to it. And I took my leadership to the next level when I stopped blaming other people. And I said, what can I do? So it's self-management, right? And so um, I get those leaders to say, yeah, I could eat better. Uh, I can I can wake up 10 more minutes, uh, 10 minutes earlier, and I can make myself something nutritious to eat, something with protein, something with value, good fats. Uh, like for breakfast, I had uh, ground chicken, some eggs, and some avocado, right? I have protein, I have good fats uh, in there, and I'm fueled for the day. I noticed that if I tried to cut corners and just have cereal loaded with sugar, loaded with all kinds of other stuff, and I'm, I'm 
dead at the mid midday, right? Sometimes we need to pick me up, right? We'll have a, the midday caf, uh, caffeine, you know, uh, or coffee or whatever, but I'm way more energized when I do that. So going back to this whole thing is when, when I can get a leader to say, yeah, I can do something different. And so if we, if we list four or five personal problems and they can say, yep, I can take responsibility for this and this is what I need to do. Then we switch it to work and we say, okay, so is it just possible? Is it possible? Not maybe a hundred percent, but is it possible that at least one or two things on your list of issues at work, you can take responsibility for. And so it's the whole connection thing. When I can be relatable and when I can make a connection to something that's every day, all I need is the leadership, to, the leadership personnel to say, it's very possible. Okay. So then where do we go first? And we just have to make that connection. And hopefully they're open to then say, I can take a little bit of responsibility for this. Right. Mm. Yeah. Here's the beauty of taking responsibility as well. You realize that, okay, I messed up, but the power is in me to change. Because if you blame other people, are you also not giving them that power to say, it's only going to change if they do something? Right, right. Mm. And, and, and if you just take the word responsibility, are you able, do you have the ability to respond in a way that you know that you should? You have to respond with the best of your ability. And if your best of your ability is to point the finger at somebody else and not take ownership, that's not an ability. Mm. You're not able to do that. Yeah. Yes. You give the power away. You say connection before correction. What do you mean by that? Yeah. So how, how am I as a leader able to correct a staff if I'm not connecting to them? I cannot correct my staff if I'm not connected to them, right? It's kind of like a bank account. I cannot withdraw if I don't make a deposit, right? If you have zero money in your account, the bank's going to say, sorry, you can't take any money out. So all my interactions are either going to be deposits or withdraws from people, right? And so do am I putting positive money? Because there are going to be times where you have to give a verbal warning or a documented write-up to the staff. Then I have to ask myself, have I made deposits? Because I know that this is gonna be a withdrawal. You cannot correct your staff if you're not correcting. So how can I correct you if I can't connect with you? That's one. Two, I also tell staff, I wanna be able to protect you and I can't protect you if I can't connect with you, right? And so we find ourselves, take on the world today, you're not going to have a heated discussion, maybe for the lack of better words, an argument with someone if you're not connected to, to something in the world, right? You're going right. to have, and, and I'm not trying to get political, but you have, you know, uh, uh, wars going on in the world. If you're connected somehow to one side, whether it's through somebody in your family is married to somebody of that, of that background, or you visited there before, you are going to have an argument and you're going to defend that side, that side. Mm. because you've made a connection with it. So how can I correct you if I ha can't connect you? And how, and how can I protect you if I can't connect with you? And so there are staff that say, hey, this, this other person came and said this, 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 and this. I'm like, okay, but you've also been written up and you don't want to take uh, any feedback from me. So I, I can kind of understand why this person is having issues because this is the character that you've created, like you created. And I'm not going to say it in that way, but this is how my thought process is. So I tell staff, if you want correction in the sense of to become better, and I explain what better is, right? Mm -hmm. Good, good uh, leaders, good employees always want to know how do I become better? Where you know that if you're a bad employee is your ears here, what am I doing wrong? No, that's not what how can I get better means. You're running a, a race and you are two minutes behind the slowest person, right? You're the slowest person, but the next slowest person is two minutes faster than you. Okay, this is how we get better. I'm not going to talk about the negative part of things. I'm talking about how do we get better? Okay, so we've been working out twice a week. Now we're, how do we get better? We need to work out four times a week. That's how we come better. But the, the negative ear hears you're bad. No. That's not what we're doing. We're, we're focusing on how do you get better? So if you want to get better, I'm going to have to correct you, but you're not going to be able to receive that correction if I'm not connected with you. It's almost like uh, 
if a parent, sometimes they say it takes a village to raise a child, but sometimes yeah. you have parents that say, don't tell me how to raise my kid, <laughs> right? Don't talk to me that, that way. And a kid's not going to take that because there's no connection there. Now, if my sister tells my son, Hey, don't say that. Don't be disrespectful to your dad or don't be disrespectful to your mom. I give my sister the authority to correct my kid if he's doing something wrong. But if so that was a stranger that connection, because yes, yeah, you're right. It's, it's the connection the piece. And so mm. you just have to realize it's going to take time, right? It's going to take time to, to connect. And so this is why it's so big for leaders is uh, we, I did a thing with uh, teachers, with students, and we do a thing called a two by 10. How do I spend two extra minutes, 10 days in a row with a, with a student? And I can talk about everything and anything, of course, age appropriate and school appropriate that is anything but school school related hey i like your shoes where did you get them what other shoes do you want oh do you know that these new shoes are coming out or or um i like those shoes because you can make them dress them up with a shirt and tie casual shoes or you can dress them down with shorts whatever well, whatever it is did you see the game last night whatever it is two minutes for 10 days and you start to see a relationship starting to build because you're talking about mm. them and everything else and we could carry this into the workplace so when we have meetings or we have what we call cooler talk, right? You guys could talk about everything and anything except stop talking about work. You see this a lot when people go on lunches. People go on lunch with coworkers and they'll talk about work. Stop, disconnect, disconnect from work. Don't talk about work. Talk about everything else and anything else but work. Uh, and so part of that connection piece is one, it needs to be authentic, uh, but two, don't talk about work ask them about their spouse, ask them about their kids, but have that connection. When you start to have that connection, you can start later on like, oh, they care about me. Well, if I care about you and I'm starting to recognize the work that you do, when I come back, and that's the other thing when it comes to recognition and feeding into people is I'm making those deposits. So when I do the withdrawal of, hey, you know what? You were late this week on a deadline. Here's the reason why we can't. And I think a lot of a lot of issues that we have in the workplace is we tell the people the what and the how, but we don't not, we don't tell them about the why. This is why this is the deadline. This if we don't turn this in, we don't get a grant or we don't get paid or we don't get whatever it is. Mm. Um, but I have to make that correction. But it's ten times better if I have that connection. True. Because, you know, I will receive it very differently if we have that connection, as you say, if once in a while you ask me about my family as my boss versus if it's all just work, work, work and always coming at me if I do something wrong, it, it, it is received very differently. Right. Well, and, and on top of that, if I can get you to connect to, to it, right? If I say, like, if you have kids and I say, remember the other day when you... Um, when you said that your son was upset or hurt because you were late picking him up from practice and it happened twice and then he he said something that was hurtful or whatever um and it made you feel that that way this is what the organization kind of feels when um it's late with uh the deadline right so we're looking forward to you finishing this work finishing this work finishing this work and it doesn't happen um it, it, it lets us down. Here's the flip side of that, that I need you to fully understand. Just because you were late with your son doesn't make you a bad mother, right? Just because you made a mistake doesn't make you a mistake. And just because maybe you think you failed doesn't make you a failure. I'm okay with you missing deadlines and, and, and falling. What I need you to do is how do I get up and dust myself off and understand I'm not a mistake. I'm not a failure. I just might need some help. So how do we communicate? What do I need to do with you to help you communicate? Hey, I don't think this is going to get done in time. I'd rather have the conversation on the front end than the back end. So this is what we're going to do for the next two weeks. I'm going to communicate with you a little bit more, not to micromanage, but to say, check in. What are we looking about? We're about 50% done. Okay, cool. So by next Tuesday, when I check in with you, we're going to be about, what do you say? And I let the employee answer me. I'll be about 70% done. Okay. So I'm going to check in with you Tuesday. Is that okay? Yeah, that's okay. Now I have permission. I made that connection. Where are we at? And then you say, I'm 75% done. 
hey, you said you were going to be 70% done. Now you're 75. Great job. High five. You know what? Let's go. Let's take a break. Let's go have lunch. And I want to hear more about your victories today. And now I'm recognizing the good behavior. And if they say I'm only about 60% done, and I know that I told you that I was 70. Okay, how can I help you? Do I need to bring somebody in? And so we just have to have that communication, but it will always happen for two things. One, if I have that connection and two, if I allow my staff to fail and them understand that it's okay to make mistakes, that's not going to mm-hmm. change you or your character in becoming a failure or a mistake. You are not that. So it's that connection piece. And when that happens, don't you think it also solves the problem you highlighted at the beginning, which was waiting until the end of the year to say, yeah. hey, yeah. this is what you did wrong. <laughs> yep. Yeah, for sure. It's got to be timely. Recognition has to be timely for sure. Mm. And then one last thought on being a courageous leader. Please, Juan, share with us. Yeah. So a courageous leader means that you will always have to have courageous conversations and we cannot be afraid to bring something up or have those hard, difficult conversations. The more you do it, uh, the easier it becomes. But I always like to, uh, you also have to understand as a leader, if you're going to have courageous conversations, you need to communicate that, right? So if I'm, let's say I'm writing you up, you're, you've come in late a week straight, we've talked about it before, now it's time for a write-up. I might tell you, hey, we're going to have a courageous conversation today. And it's not going to be courageous just on my part because it's hard for me to talk about this. It's also going to take you to be courageous because it's going to be hard to hear. And then I'm going to tell this person everything that they might feel, right? I'm kind of throwing, you know, darts in the dark a little bit and I might hit something. I might not, but there's a movie. I don't know if you're familiar with it. Maybe you are, maybe you aren't. There's a movie called Eight Mile with uh, the rapper uh... Eminem. Eminem. And mm. and the battle that he has at the very end, he tells the audience and the rapper that he's battling everything negative about him. I did get jumped and I am white trash and I do live in a trailer park and I am this and I did go here and I did go there. And at the very end, he says, now tell all these people something that they don't already know about me. I took a lesson from that movie in I'm going to tell you. You're not going to use it against me. Right, right, right. <laughs> Exactly. Exactly. That's the lesson. Right. And so I tell the the person that we're about to write, you know what, it's going to probably, you're probably going to feel like I'm pointing fingers. You're going to feel like maybe uh, you're backed against the wall. You might feel like people are ganging up on you and you might feel, you know, I might be, and, and I might use trigger words that they, that they use or keywords, excuse me, keywords that they use. Let's say they say like they use words like, um, triggered or maybe they're uh, a little bit forward and they have you know you know i'm ticked off or pissed off or something like that i might use that language and say you know what you might feel this way Mm. i need you to talk about that here like i don't want to have a meeting outside of this meeting but you're probably going to feel this way and my job is to make sure that this is a safe place for you to say yeah i do feel this way so i just want to preface that and what i'm leading up to is we talked last week about uh, being late. And I want to give you, before I get into my whole spiel, I want you to communicate with me what happened these last three days after we talked. Talk to me about uh, when you arrived at work and what's going on uh, at work. And then I let them talk and I give them every single piece uh, and time to talk. If they're, and, and I, here's the other thing too. I want to face in a place where I'm not looking at a clock and I don't have my phone or my computer screen where I can look at the time because I don't want to be a clock watcher. I don't want to be a time watcher. I don't want to be a timekeeper. I I will tell the secretary or whoever's out there, if this meeting takes 20 minutes, it takes 20 minutes. If it takes Mm. five hours, it's going to take five hours. Take everything off my schedule because I'm here solely for this person. And when I tell that person, you have all the time in the world. If this meeting takes 20 minutes, it can take 20 minutes. If it takes five hours, it takes five hours. I want you to tell me how you feel and what has happened in the last three days about about the time that you came in. And I let them feel heard and understood. And once they go through however long it takes telling me what they did wrong or taking, maybe they take ownership, maybe they blame everybody else, then I repeat exactly what I heard. So if I'm understanding you, correctly let me know if i got this right 
you were late these last three days because you didn't have a babysitter. You had this, uh, you know, a, a, a flat tire, or this happened and the schedule is really, really tough. Is that, mm -hmm. a, does that sound about right? Yes. Okay. So I want you to put yourself in my shoes. What does it look like to me? And so I want to make them to get the perspective, but then I say, you know, so what do you, what do you think that I'm to do? If I'm following, if my job is to be the gatekeeper of the policies and procedures, what do you think I'm told that I'm supposed to do in this com in this situation? And I yeah. want them to say, you have to write me up. That's right. I, it's not my organization. I get told, Hey, you need to make sure that our standards, everybody is here. And if anyone comes below that standard, we talk to them. If we talk to them once yeah. or twice or whatever the policy and procedure is, then it's a write up. Did we talk to you two or three times? Yeah. So what do you think is next? A write up. And is that fair? Yeah. Okay. Well, here it is. I need you to sign here. How can I help you show up on time? What What can I do to help you? And so that we don't go to the next step after the write up. I, I would say whatever the policy and the procedures are for your organization. My thing would be right. leadership needs to hold uh, that standard, whatever the policy and the procedure is. Because if we keep on giving chances, like you're supposed to go to one, two, three, four, right? If you do mm -hmm. one, one A, one B, one C, then you go to two people are going to think that discipline is a joke, mm, mm, right? No, and what no. is a downfall for not, for not coming, you know, for not coming in. So I want to make sure that I, uh, when that happens, that person fully understands. And then it's like, okay, so how, tell me how you're feeling. Do you feel heard? Do you feel understood? I, cause I want to make sure that you're okay. Because at the end of it, whether I heard somebody say this, wh whether it's, uh, a, a handshake, a shrug, a, a hug or a shrug, I want to make mm. sure that we both respect each other. You don't have to like it. I just want to make sure that that in you understand that I'm just following policies and procedures be, and I'm holding you accountable of holding the policies and procedures. I've gone as far as uh, saying like, how can I help you? And for a couple staff, we got permission to say, Hey, if you're coming in late and you're supposed to start from eight, you go eight to five, mm -hmm. let's see if we can make it eight 20 to five 20. You're still working your hours. We're just pushing everything it's back. It's just that you started a bit late. Yes. Right. And so if this helps, I want to make sure that we help each other. And um, when we're able to do that, and sometimes HR or the boss, the CEO says, no, sorry, but I'm going to try to fight for you, right? Because how do I protect you if I can't correct you? And the that's connection the and the yep. correction. Yep. Yes. Comes so it, that, yes, that whole principle, it plays out in so many different situations and not mm -hmm. just when the person is doing something wrong, you find solutions as well. Yeah. Yes. Thank you so much, Juan, for being here today. You are absolutely straightforward. <laughs> no chase, <laughs> no sugar coating, which is what we need. Like you said, if you're straightforward, that's how people get better. Right. Honesty. Honesty is a huge key. Right. And I think it was four things in the book, um, the leadership challenge. It says that uh, employees want from their leaders, trust and honesty, um, forward thinking, um, uh, forward thinking, um, inspiration. I'm trying to remember what the other thing is. Oh, um, uh, always growing. Like I want to know that I'm evolving and growing. So right. trust and honesty goes a long way. I can't, if I'm upset, I'm gonna let you know that I'm upset and I'm processing things. Um, and this is how it's, it's it has to be right. So trust and honesty goes a wrong way. I honor you through honesty. And so I want to honor you and I'm going to be honest with you. And that, my hope is that you do the same thing with me. If you don't feel heard, or you feel like I'm not listening, tell me and we'll, we'll figure it out. But I want to let you know that we're in this together. That's a, uh, real quick. That's the other part of the uh, courageous <laughs> conversations is when discipline happens. It's not me versus you. It's you and me on the same side. And we're looking at the issue and that's yes. courageous to say you're not necessarily the problem, but it's about time and being late. That's the problem. So how do you and I stay on the same side, look at that and say, Hmm, how do we together beat that? And that's, and that's how we have, that's how we confront conflict. It's you and I on the same side and we confront the issue. And that's part of having the, the courageous conversations. Mm. On that note, I've heard one of the guests previously said, it's like when you walk into the boardroom, and you let's say you're my boss and I need a discipline for something I did sit on the same side because you know yep. boardroom table is huge instead yep. of you sit on the opposite side you're, Roberta this is what you did 
right. when you sit on the same side as me, you actually saying, I'm not against you. We, we looking at the issue or the behavior. Right. Yeah. It, mm -hmm. I talk about, um, you're talking with the person and not at the person, right? You're on either side of that table. You're talking at them. If you're on the same side, you're talking with them. Um, right. And this even goes into parenting. I can get into a, that's a whole nother podcast about how to parent. And you should come back, by the way. We can talk about the parenting. Just have me, just have me now, and I'll do that. Yes. Mm. Yes. Communication and parenting. I've had a few guests, but much fewer than I'd like. And there's a lot that parents have had to deal with, especially in the last three years. So they, they really need the tools to communicate with their children. Yeah. So you should come back for a future show for there that. Go. Thank you so much, Juan you. Alvarado Jr. for being here today. My absolute pleasure. And before you go, where can we find you online or the social so that we can continue to have a conversation with you? Yeah, uh, thank you for that, uh, for allowing me to, to plug that in. Uh, so the website is www we raise the bar raised with a z so r a i z e the bar.com and then uh instagram you can follow me on instagram at uh raise the bar so same spelling raise the bar uh ceo at the end so you know i'm in charge of of that organization called raise the bar uh and then uh you can find me on linkedin i think it's just rtb for raise the bar dash one j u a n um, and I think raise the bar also on YouTube as well, where I drop, uh, uh, videos, leadership videos and a podcast specifically on leadership called, uh, the relevant development podcast. Oh, so you are a podcast host as well. Yeah. Yeah. Relevant development podcast was doing it off and on. And then I've just been real serious about it this year. And so, yeah, the, it, we do both personal and professional development that help you in the workplace. Oh, you should have told me. I should have promoted that during our episode. So That's the okay. relevant. Yeah, relevant development. Development yeah. podcast yeah. by Juan yeah. Alvarado Jr. Thank you so much for being on our show today. Yes, I'm going to put you. all those, just my pleasure. I'm going to put all these details on the show notes. This has been amazing. I've enjoyed our conversation. Thank Perfect. you. Perfect. Thank you. I enjoyed it as well, too. Thank you. My pleasure, Juan. Don't forget to subscribe, leave a rating and a review on Apple and Spotify, and stay tuned for more episodes to come. Thank you very 